Ouya Incorporated raised over $33 million for this video game console, and the hype was spreading everywhere, yet it faded from existence. How could this exciting and well-funded company die in only three years? Let's take a look at what really happened. Sponsored by Linode, cloud computing from Akamai. Hey everyone, how are you all doing? If you're new here, welcome. My name is Crazy Ken, and this is the Ouya. Before researching this story, I didn't remember much about the Ouya because, well, it came out over 10 years ago. But what I do remember is it was kind of a big flop. But when I did my digging, I realized there were some good things that came out of the Ouya, and perhaps it didn't deserve all the hate that it received. Ouya's origins trace back to its founder, entrepreneur Julie Ehrman. And boy, does she have a resume. Vivendi Universal Games, American Greetings Interactive, Voce Wireless, Jacked Incorporated, and IGN, working on Direct to Drive and File Planet. Oh, and Playboy, but we'll talk about that later. She moved around a lot, and she never stayed longer than two years at these companies. But perhaps Julie would stay longer at her next company. Maybe. In 2012, a new company emerged from the shadows, Boxer 8, incorporated on March 29th, and Julie was the founder and CEO. In July, tech news site The Verge spotted a video game console prototype on AngelList. There were some big names backing up this project. Yves Bahar and his company Fuse Project were also on board. This was the team that designed the Jambox and the $100 laptop. Also joining Boxer 8 was Mufi Gadiali, a former product manager at Hewlett Packard and Amazon's Kindle. Yeah, Boxer 8 had some big names involved with this project. And the official name of the prototype was Ouya. Ouya's goal was to be a $99 Android-based game console, which also doubled as a dev kit, built to be hacked. But the killer feature was the low barrier to entry for devs. Developers could self-publish on the platform and develop their games right on the same box that consumers play on. The platform wasn't just restrictive to big budget companies and AAA titles. The hype seeds were starting to be planted and then Kotaku and Eurogamer caught wind of The Verge's discovery and the Ouya started spreading. Ouya also set up a domain, ouya.tv, which initially redirected to a Wikipedia article on disruptive innovation. Ooh, these guys really wanted to send a message. They wanted to start a revolution, didn't they? Well, that sounds expensive, so you're gonna need some seed money. Tell you what, Julie, I'll get you started with a nice, crisp Washington. As for the rest of the funding, Julie et al. turned to Kickstarter. <laughs> oh, a week after the Verge story, on July 10th, 2012, the Ouya Kickstarter was officially launched with a $950,000 goal. Ouya's mission was to be a true open gaming platform, so this was a great opportunity for indie developers, who didn't have massive budgets, to get their games on TV via a game console. The pitch video also claimed every game is free to play. We'll have a full store of games, all free to play. But don't get too excited, the fine print goes into more detail. Developers can set whatever price they want for their game. They can even list it for free, no problem. But the requirement was every game, no matter the cost, had to come with a free trial. So the hype was brewing and Ouya had 30 days to meet this goal. Could they do it? abso freaking lootly They smashed the $950,000 goal in eight hours. The Ouya campaign ended on August 9th, 2012 with almost $8.6 million in funding from over 63,000 backers. At the time, it was the second most funded project on Kickstarter, behind the Pebble smartwatch. Hey, I did an episode on that too. And the CEO and founder of Pebble said it was good, so you should check that out next. After the campaign, Boxer 8 was renamed to Ouya Incorporated on August 13th, 2012. Then on December 28th, Ouya shipped out early units to developers so they could get a head start on game making. The Ouya dev kit was clear and it was bundled with two controllers. Then, as promised, the Ouya started shipping to Kickstarter backers on March 28th, 2013. But it appeared Ouya needed a few more bucks, so they raised an additional $15 million in an investment round led by Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers, with additional investments from multiple other firms and NVIDIA. Ouya also announced the console would be available at Best Buy, GameStop, Target, and Amazon, with availability starting in the US, Canada, and UK. It was only 11 months from the Kickstarter to the launch. Pretty good. And they launched these things in retail on June 25th, 2013. So let's take a look at it. I actually bought two. This is the retail version, and this is the Kickstarter version. And the Kickstarter version that I found was actually on eBay, and it was listed as factory sealed, with a photo that shows it unsealed. Not confusing at all. But both units are here now, so let's take a look at the hardware. The Ouya has a tiny cube-like design made of brushed aluminum with a curved base and glossy black plastic on the top and bottom. The length and width were 2.95 inches, and the height was 3.23 inches, and it weighed only 11 ounces. 
On top is a power button with LED, and on the back is a 1080p HDMI port, USB 2, a micro USB port for connecting to a computer, an Ethernet port, and power connector. True to Ouya's open policy, the internals were easy to access. Simply unscrew four hex screws on top, and the lid pops off. For specs, the Ouya was powered by an NVIDIA Tegra 3 SoC, and 1GB of shared onboard DDR3 memory. The Tegra 3 was a mobile-oriented processor, so you typically wouldn't see it in a video game console, but normal consoles are bigger and more expensive. This was tiny and only 100 bucks. Ouya also had 8GB of internal flash storage, and external USB storage was supported in a November 2013 software update. And for wireless, Ouya had 802.11n Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 4.0 LE. I think the team did a good job with the console design. I think it looks pretty, and as some of you may know, I am a fan of cubes. So now that brings us to the controller. When I was researching this story and interviewing owners, the biggest complaint I saw was that the controller was not very good. Which is funny because the Ouya spokespeople constantly talked about how important the controller was. The most important part of this to us is the controller. But before I ridicule it too much, let's talk about the positives. The Ouya controller connects via Bluetooth, and it features dual analog sticks, a D-pad, four face buttons in an OUYA arrangement, two triggers, and two bumpers. And there's a home button in the middle with the Ouya logo on it. The controller is comprised of plastic and brushed aluminum in a black and silver color scheme, matching the console. The original controller in the pitch video had a lighter look, and the face buttons all had an O on them. The community responded to this with colorblind accessibility concerns, and to Ouya's credit, they listened and modified the buttons with different letters. Apparently this middle part is a touchpad, and during the initial testing where Brainiac, Brent, and me were tinkering with everything, we didn't even know this was a touchpad. I only found out when I interviewed people. The design does not make it clear that this is an interactive element for the controller, unlike on the PlayStation 4 where it's much more obvious. One thing that initially confused me is, where the heck do the batteries go? There's no hatch on the back like there is on a typical controller. So, what the heck? I know! Let's consult the Quick Start Guide! Oh, the guide doesn't tell us how to put in the batteries. How much money did this thing raise again? Oh yeah. For fun, I checked the Kickstarter guide, and it's even more useless because it's just the boilerplate legal copy. So I had to Google it. And what you have to do, you have to pry one off on this side for one battery, and you have to pry <laughs> the other side off for the, <laughs> for the other battery. There you go. That's how you get to the batteries. In Ouya's defense, they had customizable faceplate options available in December 2013, but like, this is still really finicky. So what are some other problems we noticed with the controller? Well, Brainiac Brent did some extensive testing and he noticed there was sometimes latency. I noticed the problem too when I was playing Skyriders, and some of my interviewees confirmed this issue as well, so it's widespread. I don't know if it's just the game, but like, it does feel like it's not responding it, like immediately after I touch a control. That's probably your controller. <laughs> oh, sh And the triggers, they just kind of feel... Uh, grindy? You can really hear and feel the spring crunching when you press them. And the input is not consistent, despite holding the trigger in the same place. In our test against a GameCube controller, we found the Ouya triggers were a tad jittery. Also, the handles are really fat. Just for comparison, here's the handles next to an Xbox One controller and a GameCube controller. The Ouya is thick. I'm getting some Xbox Duke vibes from this. Maybe not as bad, but still thick. I interviewed Ron from Ron's Computer Videos, and he said his son stopped playing with the Ouya because the controller hurt his hands. Yeah. I think I can see why. Originally, I thought these shortcomings were just due to the price. The console and the controller together is $99, and sometimes lower price just means lower quality. But Ouya sold these controllers individually for $49.99, which is only 10 bucks less than the PlayStation and Xbox controllers. You're gonna have a hard time competing with them. So that's the hardware. Now let's take a look at the software. Ouya's software is built on Android 4.1 Jelly Bean, but Ouya uses a custom launcher for the main user interface, so you don't really see much Androidness until you open certain system-related menus. Through the main menu, you can access your game library and the store, where you can try and buy new games. The store is not available anymore, and I'll explain why soon, but a new store is accessible thanks to a new Ouya server hosted by Christian Weiska. Shout out to Ouya World and Xerix for the Connectia PowerShell script and setup guide. Brainiac Brent followed it to get my Kickstarter Ouya unit up and running. Ouya encouraged hacking the system, so it's pretty easy to root, and doing so won't void your warranty. 
You can also sideload applications via USB, and in an August 2014 update, you could now sideload Android packages, APKs, over the internet via the Make menu. So after all, this is a video game console, so we should probably talk about video games. When the Ouya launched to backers, 104 titles were available, including Final Fantasy III, Stalag Flight, and Save the Puppies. So it's not just indies, big titles and big publishers were on this platform too. There were even Sonic games. By the time Ouya launched to the public, there were over 178 games, including You Don't Know Jack. Julie, you, you can say just shy of 180 games, or even better, over 170 games, but you can't say over 178 games. That's weird. A noteworthy title on the Ouya was Towerfall, developed by Matty Thorson, who would later go on to create hit game Celeste, which, as of today, has an overwhelmingly positive rating on Steam with 76,683 reviews. Towerfall wound up being the number one selling game on Ouya, which sold 7,000 copies. Sounds like things are going great. So, what the heck happened? How did this whole company die in only three years? You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Unfortunately, Ouya fell short of many people's expectations. On the bright side, Ouya did receive praise for its low cost, small size, and openness, but many criticisms stemmed from the limited game selection and poor performance of the system. Yeah, see the, oh, there we go. We got some like cursor lag going on here. You get what you pay for? Remember, this whole bundle is only 99 bucks. This half of it is only about 50 bucks. To people who don't know how Tegra 3s work, and they just listen to Julie in the marketing, they probably thought this would be more powerful. This is a beautiful outside with an incredibly powerful inside. And then later they were disappointed by some of the performance issues. Another disappointment was no Minecraft! Even though Julie herself said Minecraft would be on the console in the pitch video, that never happened. Minecraft is going to be on it. Ouya's Kickstarter quoted this paragraph from Mojang, which said, I could see all current Mojang games go on the platform if there's a demand for it. Minecraft creator Notch tweeted, The problem with Minecraft for the Ouya is that it's Android. And our Android version of Minecraft isn't exactly that super great. You could sideload the pocket edition of Minecraft if you want, but that's not really a great TV experience. And there were more problems. Like I hinted at earlier, the controller received a lot of criticism. And since I already harped on that, I'm not gonna beat a dead horse. Thankfully, Ouya tried fixing some controller latency problems with a software update. But I'm not sure how effective it truly was because Brainiac Brent noticed latency with the latest version of the software available. I noticed the same issues too. Julie also stated the company was quietly refining the controller hardware while also announcing plans for a new Ouya in 2014, which we will discuss in a bit. But sadly, all these aforementioned issues were just the tip of the iceberg. Despite tens of thousands of registered developers, many were not embracing the platform enough, so there weren't enough must-have titles on the Ouya to convince people to go out and buy one. Even the top-selling game we talked about earlier, Towerfall, sold only 7,000 copies. I think that's a pretty good start for an all-new platform. Like, it's hard to build an all-new ecosystem. But once the exclusivity deal ended for that game, Towerfall sold way more successfully on other platforms. And Gadget estimated that 80% of Thorson's sales were from PC and PS4, generating way more revenue than Ouya. Thorson went on to say, being the best game on Ouya isn't a huge deal, but it is nice. Ouch. These issues resulted in an overall lack of adoption for developers, which consequently means there's less must-have game titles on the platform for end users. And that means you're gonna have less users using the platform now. So. Ouya wanted to fix this problem and spice things up a little bit. They wanted to incentivize developers. Introducing the Free the Games Fund. On July 18th, 2013, Ouya announced a year-long $1 million funding program for developers. If a dev raised a minimum of $50,000 on Kickstarter for their new game, Ouya would match the funds up to a quarter million dollars as long as the developers agreed to make their game Ouya exclusive for at least six months. That sounds pretty awesome. I'm gonna make a game now just gotta bust out Game Maker like I did in the old days. Hey, if Undertale can be made on Game Maker, I can make something on Game Maker. It's a valid platform. Now what happens when you offer this kind of low-hanging fruit? People are gonna game the system. One of the first two games to meet this threshold was Gridiron Thunder, a football game. Some suspicions arose when the game raised $10,000 each from at least three anonymous accounts in the 11th hour. But Andrew Wan, the CEO of the game's company, Mogo Text, said this was due to generous friends in the tech industry. Despite this pissing off some people, Kickstarter found no wrongdoing and let the campaign proceed. The second game, however, met a different fate. 
Elementary My Dear Holmes was a point-and-click adventure game being developed by Victory Square Games. Kickstarter suspended this campaign after it raised $58,770. Kickstarter reported to Wired that it found the campaign to be in violation of the rules, but they didn't specify which one. According to Engadget, the game's developer, not sure if they mean Sam or someone else at Victory, said the suspension had to do with, quote, suspicious accounts. In Sam's statement, he says he does not know 100% why they got suspended, and Kickstarter didn't give a reason. If that's true, that's some BS on Kickstarter, in my opinion. Sam did admit he and his employees created some accounts for immediate friends and family, and he convinced some other non-Victory employees to donate too. These other folks shared an office space with Victory, but they weren't necessarily working for Victory. We may never know the true reason why Kickstarter decided to suspend Victory's game, but not Mogo's. And on a side note, Victory Square Games' Facebook is inaccessible, their Twitter has been suspended, and Sam's Kickstarter account has also been deleted. Do with that what you will. But it didn't end there. Another game, Dungeons, The Eye of Draconis, also joined the fund, but many Kickstarter users accused the developer, Sucker Free Games, of gaming the system. Later, lead designer William McDonald revealed his father used retirement funds to pledge most of the money to the campaign. In this situation, the case was much more black and white. Ouya straight up ripped these guys out of the fund. McDonald posted an update to his Kickstarter titled, with deep regret, and he went on to say that we have no plans to develop for Ouya any further, and he canceled the funding. It was nice of him to plug never-ending nightmares, though. Dungeons eventually launched on Steam, currently holding 53% positive reviews. Dang. You know, I kind of feel bad for Ouya. They were trying to do something nice for developers, and people were just cheating the system and or accusing others of cheating the system. And this tarnished Ouya's image. And I don't think they were in the wrong. They didn't deserve that. In the midst of these controversies, Ouya changed the rules. The new minimum goal was $10,000 and 100 backers. And to Julie's credit, she clearly says if Ouya or the community feels devs are gaming the system, your game will undergo review. What a cluster f But unfortunately, another bad move was right around the corner. On August 20th, 2013, Ouya posted an ad to their YouTube channel titled, 60 bucks for a game? This ad was animated and it was, um... <laughs> Bucks? Ugh, this game sucks. Uh. Oh, 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 oh. I. Oh, they did it to me again. Ooh yeah. What the heck were you thinking? I could have. Oh. Maybe they were going for shock value, or <laughs> maybe they were trying to be experimental, like with the PS3 baby. But I don't know. Ooh yeah. This just felt way off. An Ouya rep told Kotaku, we are experimenting with animated content and posted this video briefly to get feedback from our community. Stay tuned for our official video. Ouya then released a replacement video on February 19th, 2014, and it's much less edgy. So things were looking kind of bleak for Ouya, but they weren't dead yet. It was time for a new Ouya. Not Ouya 2 or anything, just some small tweaks really. This new model came with double the storage, 16 gigabytes, and it featured an all white design, which I think is sexy as fuck. This Ouya went up for pre-order on November 18th for $129. Then after that limited stock was gone, another similar model, this time in a matte black finish, replaced it and launched on January 31st, 2014. In March, Ouya announced something new, Ouya Everywhere. This was an effort to try to get their game catalog on more hardware, starting with Mad Cat's Mojo. However, this effort didn't help much because on September 2nd, 2014, reports surfaced that Ouya was in possible sale talks with multiple Chinese companies, including Xiaomi and Tencent. During this quest to find a buyer, on January 29, 2015, Ouya managed to raise $10 million from Alibaba, bringing the investment total to $33.6 million. This was part of an effort to get Ouya's software into the lucrative Chinese market. Okay. Now they were dead. What do you mean, Ken? I thought they just raised more money. Yeah, you know, I was surprised too. But back in around late 2013, Ouya was actually in debt to a venture capital firm. But this news wasn't unearthed until April 2015. But apparently, about a year and a half prior, Ouya quietly took on an undisclosed amount of debt from Triple Point Capital. Back to the present day, at this point in the company's dwindling life, Ouya could not renegotiate the debt with their investors. So Ouya needed a buyer, and fast. Thankfully, Ouya had some good assets. Their dev team, their technology, and their game catalog, 
Yeah, it maybe wasn't the biggest thing in the world, but it was still a decent collection of software. On June 12, 2015, Ouya finally found a buyer. Want to guess who it was? You don't have to, I'll tell you. It was Razer. Razer acquired many of their assets for an undisclosed all-cash amount, but the deal did not include hardware assets. So the Ouya console was officially discontinued on July 27, 2015. The final sales count was approximately 200,000 units. So Amazon, uh, how, many have, how many have you sold? A lot. Can you give me a, a range? A lot. Like a No, I mean, a, we're, we're, a really, we're really pleased. You're not going to tell me a number. No, I'm right? not. Razer's plan was to move Ouya users into Forge TV, which was also an Android-based micro console, which they announced in January 2015. Huh, it seems like the industry is listening to Ouya. Oh, never mind. Razer discontinued Forge TV in November of the same freaking year. The Ouya died. The Mojo died. Forge TV died. The market for these micro consoles just didn't exist back then. At least Razer supported the Ouya online services for almost four years, but then they officially shut them down. Date of death? June 25th, 2019. This shutdown rendered the Ouya store and many applications unusable for a while. But thanks to Viska and the Ouya community, people can use their Ouya similarly to back in the day. So the Ouya was dead. The company was gone. But what happened to Julie? The woman who started it all. Well, like in her past, she moved from one company to another really quickly. After Ouya, she was at Jaunt VR, Highway 1, Lionsgate, Wonder, and... You know what's coming next? Playboy! Julie served as the president of media at Playboy Enterprises Incorporated from September 2018 to May 2020. Again, pretty short. Tis her MO. Unfortunately, we can't show any of Julie's Playboy work on this show because that might not fit our content rating. Oh. So that's what that looks like. After Julie was done playing with the boys, she played with the girls. In football. Or soccer, however you want to call it. Argue amongst yourselves. On July 21st, 2020, Julie founded LA-based football club Angel City, which played their first game in the National Women's Soccer League in the 2022 season. And Julie is still there, four and a half years later. Great job, Julie. I think you finally found something you're more passionate about than television. Television, the television, 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 the television, the television. I love the television. So now that leaves us with one final big question. Why did the Ouya fail? Before I get too critical, let's start on the optimistic side. Ouya had some merit to it. Indie games are on bigger platforms now, and they've received lots of sales. Among Us, Undertale, Five Nights at Freddy's, and Cuphead, just to name a very small few. Heck, even Minecraft started as an indie game, and now it's owned by one of the wealthiest companies in the world, Microsoft. And I think the Ouya helped influence some of that growth in the indie space. But Ouya is not off the hook completely. The company still made decisions that led them to their own demise. So here's my four big reasons why I think Ouya failed. Number one, poor value. $99 sounds like a great price for a video game console because it's cheap. But at the end of the day, consumers don't want cheap, they want value. And keep in mind, this console was competing against the big boys, Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft. So if you don't offer that killer value, like great exclusive games that you can't get anywhere else, you're toast. Number two, Ouya focused on two groups of customers at once. When you watch the Ouya pitch video, at one point it seems great for developers, then maybe great for gamers, then great for developers again. It keeps flipping back and forth. Who are you actually targeting? I get it that they wanted to be bold and do both at once, and maybe if the company was bigger and more experienced, they could have rolled out more focuses over time. Because in real life, you can have a great fork or a great spoon. But if you put them together, you get kind of a half-assed solution. A spork. What was it that Ron Swanson said? Never half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing? I live by that. In my opinion, I think Ouya accidentally made a really good developer box, but they kind of forgot to also make it a great video game console. Number three, empty promises. The Ouya hype was blown out of proportion because of this whole openness, free the games revolution. At the beginning, the marketing worked and everyone was hyped up and emotionally invested. They were excited and willing to spend their money. But then when they got the product, they were like, oh, this isn't as good as I thought it was gonna be. And that leads to a lot of disappointed customers. Many people I interviewed didn't use their Ouyas for more than a year or two. And there were some straight up misleading promises. In the pitch video, Julie says Minecraft will be on the Ouya. In reality, that never happened. And Julie also said, all free to play when talking about games. But that's kind of misleading to people who don't know better. 
It's all free to play. And that brings us to the fourth and final reason as to why I believe Ouya failed. Julie. Sorry, Julie, if you're watching this, nothing personal. The more I watched her give speeches and do interviews, the more I just kind of felt like she was faking it until she makes it. And she undersells the Ouya sometimes, or sometimes she's just not very clear about the Ouya's mission. And she's also not very aware of the competition. Minority media is building a game that actually leverages the buttons and the touchpad, right? Because our controller has a touchpad. You're not going to find that somewhere else. Um, and the reality well, the is... New, the new PlayStation 4 controller has a touchpad, doesn't it? That's true. It? They could build it for that. So... But they're building it for me. That's what I know. That's embarrassing. What happens if, uh, the, you know, PS4 and the next Xbox, they're, they're like, hey, we want to get all, everybody in here. Self-publishing is a thing. It basically is the App Store, some variation of the App Store. How does that affect your business? Does it affect your business? It's like saying, what do you do if there's an earthquake? What? It could happen, but it doesn't benefit me to spend time thinking about that. Oh, I feel like you should be concerned with that, maybe? Again, lack of awareness. Also, here she is talking about the face buttons on the controller. Yeah, and then they had another Reddit poll to figure out where the O should be and starting it. Eve said it should be it at goes, the bottom. It goes uh, clockwise? Counterclockwise. Oh, really? Counterclockwise. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Julie, you have the controller with you. You can check this. Your face buttons go clockwise, not counterclockwise. Are you okay? You need a coffee? But I'd have to say my favorite Julie moment is this. There is nothing special about this board. Nothing. Like, nothing. <laughs> Look, I get that she was trying to imply that the ecosystem and the software and the games are more important than the hardware itself, but saying part of your product is nothing special still doesn't sound that great. Imagine if Steve Jobs went on stage with the iPhone, held it up and said, this is not special. It sounds kind of dumb, right? So Julie, in my opinion, doesn't strike me as an honest, clear visionary who can lead a company to success. And as the old saying goes, a fish rots from the head down. If leadership is bad, it'll trickle down to the rest of the company. And I believe these four factors are what sadly killed Ouya. On the bright side, Julie appears to be happy in her Angel City venture, and indie video games are flourishing on a whole new level today. And I think part of that is thanks to the Ouya's influence. Oh, and remember how I mentioned Ouya was purchased by Razer? Well, another company was bought out recently, Linode. Akamai bought them. And if you have an application or website that needs to be scaled and deployed, Linode has the infrastructure and the 24-7 support you need. Linode offers out-of-box apps for game servers like TF2, CSGO, and even Minecraft. You can run your own virtual private network with OpenVPN, build an online application with Joomla's content management system, or build a video streaming site with a multitude of app choices. There's so much you can do with Linode's affordable Linux virtual machines. And to boot, they offer award-winning 24-7 technical support. Visit linode.com slash computerclan and click one of the sign-up buttons, and we'll give you a 60-day $100 credit just for watching this episode. And when you do that, you're also supporting the Computer Clan, so thank you very much. So here we are at the end of 2023. We're ending the year with cubes, and we're starting 2024 with spheres. So subscribe and stay tuned for my Nexus Q episode in January. Catch the crazy and pass it on. Wait, we forgot one important question. Can it run crisis? Television.